Hello and welcome back to the game room. You know what I love? Video games. You know what I love talking about? Games. And it seems like a lot of people these days who cover games seem to hate them. Or at least, the people who play them. Well that's not me, and that's not the 1796 of you beautiful people checking out this video here today. We are 4 subscribers away from 1800. Unbelievable. Thank you all so much. The growth, the comments, the likes, everything, the random view spikes. Thank you all. I say it every time. I'm going to keep saying it. Thank you all so much. Thank you for the likes, the shares, the comments. And today, I wanted to talk about some times that I got it wrong. It doesn't happen often, but it does happen. So if that sounds interesting to you, let's check it out. There's a lot of games out there, some of which you've never even heard of. That's where I come in. My name's Luke. I've been playing games since the age of two, and I have no life. This is my game. So usually I'm good at predicting about what games I'm going to like. You know, sometimes a game will come out that I wasn't that interested in and it will be successful, but these particular games are ones that I was dead wrong on. So I thought they were going to be terrible, had no interest, and in some instances, these are my favorite games of all time. So let's get started with the game that had me doing this video, and that is the recently released Sea of Stars. So Sea of Stars is a game that I kickstarted. It harkens back to the old SNES RPGs of Chrono Trigger and things of that nature. And they had a demo come out on it about six months ago, I want to say. And I did not enjoy the demo. In fact, I did not enjoy it so much that I did not play this game when it came out. And if not for the lull between me beating the last game I played and Spider-Man 2 coming out, I don't know if I would have played it yet. But I had some time, and I put it in, and wow. The demo gave us, in my opinion, the worst possible place they could start. So this is a game made by the people who made The Messenger. So if you're familiar with The Messenger, this does have very tongue-in-cheek writing. And the demo decided to highlight the, the, the pirate crew and the, the early game combat where you're drastically under-leveled and under-geared, and they throw everything at you at once, which usually... I'm okay with, I like learning on the fly, but a big portion of Sea of Stars combat involves being okay with uh, your team getting knocked out and then not having a reagent or a spell to revive them because they will automatically revive after the stars circling their head go away. So this is a big mechanic. In addition to that, there's a mechanic where you can interrupt enemies with uh, certain attacks, but only certain people can use lunar or certain people can use solar or knives or blunt instruments, and it's just... Funnily enough, starting the game from the beginning, they introduce you to all these concepts, you learn it, you get really attached to Garl, who's the third character you have in the demo, which, if, if you're familiar with the game, when it was pitched, it really was talking about the, the, the sun guy and the moon girl. And so when you start the game and you have a third person, which I thought this might just be a two-person RPG, it's not. There's actually a party that you get, and it's a very smart party system that allows you, even though I'm not a huge, I'm usually not a fan of swapping out party members during fight, but this does it well. There's no penalty, you can swap back and forth, it's handled masterfully. A uh, big drawback on the game, I would say, is that every combat encounter is not mindless, which I know is a catch-22, but I'm, a, I'm someone who likes multiple genres, so when I go into an RPG, I don't necessarily want it to be a constant struggle the entire time. I like it where mindless, 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 get to the boss, all right, let's buckle down. Mindless, mindless, let's buckle down. In this game, that's not the case. Every single enemy encounter is always at least three enemies. You always feel like you're behind the game, and until now, I'm almost at the very end of the game, do I finally feel like my power has increased to the moment where I can take on stuff and not have to think about it as much, but still, you still have to be cognizant. It introduces that Mario RPG-like timing mechanics, which is fun, but it's also kind of the problem I had with Thousand Year Door, where it's the, the mechanics are so involved that it's not just timing the button when you hit it or when you're attacked. You do time it when you get attacked, but uh, some of them require you to hold the button down, some of you require to bounce back, and things of that nature. It's a solid game. I've cooled off on it a little bit, but I was thinking it was going to be terrible based on the demo, and I could not have been more wrong. A very, very solid game. Great homages to the games of yesteryear. Several, th and, and the fact that it was made by the people from The Messenger, there's even some throw-up backs to The Messenger where you enter a land that pretty much is the land from The Messenger. 
Uh, writing aside, I do think the sometimes it gets a little bit too in its own. Super cool craziness! Oh my god, you did that! Wow, that's amazing! You are so like, you know, a little bit, <laughs> a little bit too 2023 at times. But all in all, a solid game. I was wrong on it. You should definitely check it out if you like old school RPGs. You will love it. It is a good time. All right, another game that I was really, really wrong on was a game you wouldn't think I would be—I would think would be bad, but that was Hades. So when this game came out for early access and only on the computer, seeing as how Super Giant Games before then had done essentially uh, PlayStation exclusives or download uh, things on the Xbox Live with Bastion, I was a little on the fence about it. I'm like, why are you guys doing early access? I know Pyre had just come out and didn't get great reviews. It was decent enough, but I was wondering, are you guys slipping a little bit? I wasn't I wasn't so sure. And then it got released on PC, but still you didn't hear much about it until it got the, the console release and then it just took the world by fire, including myself. This was my game of the year in, I think, 2020. 20. I absolutely loved it. Completely combines the roguelike elements with a smart story that then makes sense and just is phenomenal. Every run was different. All the different weapons were fun to use. You have to go through and beat the game 10 times in order to unlock the true ending and it was a ball doing it. And it's one of those things where it takes you so long to beat it the first time, especially getting through the uh, the World 3 boss, which was uh, the Minotaur and Theseus, which that boss fight, holy crap, is that a that is a pain in the ass. That so many deaths there. But once you get the synergies down, once you get the runs down, it really is just a phenomenal game from start to finish and thoroughly a game that I wasn't super wrong on it. I didn't think it was going to be terrible because I know the company does great games. I just didn't think it'd be as good as it was. All right, here's one that might surprise you, but the game that Sea of Stars was really trying to emulate was a game called Chrono Trigger. Now, why was I wrong on Chrono Trigger? It's not even about the game as much as my buddy David at the time was a huge Chrono Trigger fan and I was a huge Link to the Past fan and we would have tons of fights about which game was better and he kept telling me you gotta play it you should check it out it's amazing and I didn't want to believe him I don't know what it, it's fanboyness I didn't want to be wrong and so I wanted to pick it up but I only wanted to pick it up on a sale so I saw it at Toys R Us all the time for like a good three years it was always seventy dollars never went on sale never got it then at a certain point it was just too far past I was playing N64 and PS1 games Super Nintendo games were kind of not at my radar when I bought stuff off eBay they were coming without the box and the manual so I just let it go and I finally played it in 2014 of all times when I was unemployed at the time and wanted to check out some games. I played it first as a ROM and oh my goodness, what a revelation, a phenomenal game. I was so stupid for waiting to play it. If I had played that back then, who knows, my collecting might have been way different. I might have dabbled in the other RPGs at the time, picked up Final Fantasy 3, Final Fantasy 2, you know, 6 and 4. But there you have it, I was dead wrong. And let's run through the other ones I was dead wrong on because of my buddy David. So another one would be Secret of Mana, or Mana. So much for the same reasons, I would see him and his brother John Austin playing it. It just, the art style looked too bright. It was always a little too cartoony for myself. The music was a little too upbeat. It's funny because I love looking at that art style now, but at the time, I don't know what it was. It felt a little chunky or a stupid 10-year-old stupid me or 9-year-old me. And they were like this little pixie girl and this anime dude. I don't know what it was. I was an idiot. But I just, I didn't have interest. They even had a multi-tab. We could have played three players. I could have done it. And I didn't. I didn't end up playing Secret of Mana until 2013 with my next door neighbor, Ryan. And he walked me through the game and we had such a blast going through and doing that game co-op. Like, I'm sure it's fun single player, but playing that co-op the way it really was designed to be is just so much fun. Yeah, you have to take the pauses when someone goes into their ring menus because the only way to increase your magic is by using your magic. So that gets a little arduous and it is once you get those higher level charges holding it down for 30 seconds before, between attacks can get annoying. But it's the music's great, the, the storyline is well paced, and it's just a super fun game all around. And another one I was dead wrong on. I should have picked it up. I should have been playing it. And then the last one is a game I played this year and loved it, and that is the legendary Xenogears. So I just was on the fence about ever playing it. Once again, the all three of these games, my buddy David, I call them the, the trifecta of David games, because I didn't want to play them. 
And I don't know what it was. I, I don't know why I didn't. Uh, it's You know how it is with that friend of yours who's always like, see, I, I told you that was good. And you're like, no, it's not good. Stupid. So stupid. Such a good game. So crazy. I didn't even know the game wasn't ever, ever finished. One of those <laughs> dream scenarios where maybe someday they'll do a remake of it and actually complete the second disc. That'd be phenomenal. Maybe do the Final Fantasy VII remake treatment. Who knows? problem is most of those people are with Monolith uh, and no longer with Square. But it just such a fun game. Interesting combat for the mech side and the human side. But really, it's for me, it was the story and the music that drove it through. The, the combat wore thin a little bit towards the end. It wasn't great. It's one of those things where the sum of its part are, parts are greater than the whole. Or if that makes any sense. It just The combat system wasn't the best, but everything else around it wasn't phenomenal. Now, here's one that I was dead wrong about once again with my friend Derek. You're going to see that. He's got a couple more <laughs> entries on this list. But this was a game that he made me borrow, and I'm so glad he did. And that was Castlevania Symphony of the Night. So I, before this, had played no Castlevanias other than Castlevania 64. And I'll be honest, I hate on Castlevania 64, but it wasn't that terrible of a game, but it also wasn't that great of a game. So it was one of those things where, you know, like a, a 7, maybe a 7.5, something where I beat it, never wouldn't play it again, but, you know, I wouldn't say it was the worst thing I ever, I didn't regret purchasing it, but it wasn't something I wanted to play again immediately, and then when my buddy David's like, oh, you gotta play Symphony of the Night, you know that game you just played, well, here it is in 2D on the PlayStation, ah, it just, it didn't, it didn't sound great, but, you know, I don't know how he did it, maybe it's because he let me borrow it, and I played it, popped it in, and I was just enraptured from the beginning of it. The the fact that you can gain abilities, you could go and search for this whole castle, go back and forth, turn into mist, turn into wolf. I think that might have been what sold me on it, was when I found you could transform in the stuff. I don't know what was so interesting or intriguing about that, but that just sounded so cool. I can turn into mist? Ooh, maybe it reminded me of Zelda 2 turning into the fairy. I don't know, but getting things like the vampire cloak and then beating the game only to discover you only beat half the game. There's an upside down version that continues it and doubles the experience. Just a magical experience. I loved every minute of it and I was so wrong on that one and I'm proud that I made up for it. So another one that I was dead wrong on was a fairly recent game. Now, it might be, uh, it's definitely in the dregs now, but when it first came out, Overwatch, everyone loved it. And I was so vehemently opposed to it, but my buddy Rewind Mike, my buddy Sean, my buddy Donovan, everyone was playing it. They're all saying, you gotta check this out. So I bought it for $40, uh, I put it into my PC, and surprisingly enough, I found Mercy, and I loved it. I love the, the challenge, uh, and this was the, the beginning of the game, the first couple weeks before any of the nerfs or anything that changed, back when uh, her ultimate would revive everyone on the screen, and you know, just before they added all the additional characters, and I had such a blast. I was the elusive Mercy, flying in, healing people up, dodging, hiding back, pulling out my pistol, finishing off fools. My buddy Rewan would be Farah, and I'd be flying up in the air with her, holding her down while she would be doing her rocket strikes. My other buddy would be playing Lucio, knocking people off the... It was so much fun. I have to say, it was so much fun. Or getting those that play of the game where you had heroes never die right at the last push, and you revive the entire team, avoiding a wipe really really fun moments and i am so glad i gave it the time of day to play it unfortunately what happens with a lot of these games that are ongoing they they kind of in my opinion made it less fun the loot boxes started wearing on you the outfit started wearing on you the fact that there's no single player or progression it's always the same thing over and over i don't really care about my standing as far as being silver platinum things of that nature and it just it lost its appeal after a while i never really got good with anyone else uh, i was decent at genji i would play reaper sometimes um, but really, it was Mercy or Bust, and once they started messing with Mercy, I just, I, I wasn't really interested in playing it anymore. But for the time that I, I was playing it, I was enjoying it, and I had been, like I said, dead wrong on that game. Now, here's one that's interesting. So, I did not expect this game to be that good. They were making another one, 
Uh, Doom 3 wasn't that great, so when they announced they're doing Doom 2016, just called Doom, already annoying, they don't call it Doom 4, or whatever Doom it would have been. The only Doom I had played up to that point was Doom 64, and much like a Castlevania 64, it was enjoyable enough, but not so much that I wanted to go back and play it. This time, it was another first-person shooter, though this one was supposed to be more action-paced and fast and furious and, you know, other expletives. But I just, I, w I was tepid on it. I was waiting, I was waiting to be smug when it came out and be like, yep, not good, not good. And then it came out and everyone loved it and everyone said how great it was. And so I finally had to pick it up. I think I got it on sale for maybe $30, $40 that year for Black Friday and I played it and it was a revelation. For someone who's so over the first person genre to have a game like this where it not only encouraged you to play like a maniac, but you got rewarded for it. So going in, attacking people and healing you is such a brilliant mechanic. I have not tried Doom Eternal yet. I heard Doom Eternal. Some people said it was good. Some people said it wasn't as good as Doom 2016. But Doom 2016, I had a great time playing and highly recommend checking it out. Or Doom Eternal. I, would, I think it's still based on the same metrics. Now here's one that I first read about, and this was before I had a PS3, and I just thought, really, you're going back to that well again, how many zombie stories are we going to have? We have The Walking Dead, we have State of Decay, we have uh, the, the one where you're stuck in the mall, we have Left 4 Dead, The Walking Dead Telltale series, uh, you name it, so it's The Plants vs. Zombies, like we're really going to do another zombie story? Oh, this time it's with Fungus! Great, great. It's a fungus instead of a virus. Call, call Tyrant. But The Last of Us on PS3 was very, very, very good. And this was one of those cases where I thought the my initial ideas on it, thought it looked bad, but when I picked it up, hooked within the first three minutes. <laughs> it just, it felt like a polished experience made by the people who made Uncharted. So I had already played all three Uncharted's by the time this game came out. So I was familiar with how to play it. And it just really felt like it took that, that kind of off the seat of your pants, high flying, fun adventure game and then dropped it in the middle of a serious incident. I wouldn't say survival horror because it's not. Uh, and yes, it does have a crafting system, but this was before crafting systems were as prevalent and as annoying as they've become in recent years. So I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the movie aspect, the storyline, the relationship between Joel and Ellie. It was really one of those first games where the voice acting didn't annoy me too. It really added to it. And just certain things, like when you break into the, the hospital and you have the different choice you can with the doctors and things of that nature. Now the ending... I wasn't crazy about the ending. I remember hearing going into the game, oh, the ending, oh my God, it's gonna blow you away. So maybe that's on myself for having too much hype getting to the ending that did happen and seeing like, oh, oh, that was it? Oh, uh, okay. That probably would've been more impactful if I wasn't expecting, you know, some, some giant lava monster to come out. But still, phenomenal game, really, really well done. And something that I am still trying to pick up Last of Us Part 1 for the PS5, but it has never been cheaper than, I want to say, $40. So hopefully this year for Black Friday, it'll be cheaper. But I'm not sure if it will. It probably didn't sell that well. All right, here is one that... I was so convinced was not going to be great. Uh, it may come down to the fact that at the time I really was against a lot of the Dark Souls types games and this just looked like another reskin of a genre that, you know, the Ghost of Tsushima looked much more interesting. Oh god, Sekiro Shadows Die Twice. This is going to be great. Not. Could not have been more wrong. I don't know what snapped in my head on launch day when I watched someone playing it. And I'm like, you know what? That actually does look decent. And I'm so glad I did because this is the game that finally taught me how to play FromSoft games. And I think it's because it had a dedicated pathway for level ups, for character progression you knew what to do you had the ability to jump and you have the the ability to revive yourself so you technically have a second chance on every single life which is nice so if you just make one stupid mistake you have a second stupid mistake that you can do really enjoyed it really loved Sekiro I don't know if I would say it or Elden Ring are my favorite in the Souls-like games it's definitely none of the Dark Souls or Demon Souls I'm still not crazy about that uh, it, honestly, it, if I was gonna, I mean, Elden Ring was great, don't get me wrong, but if you ask me which one I would rather play, 
I probably rather play Sekiro just because it is so much more catered to it in my mind a experience should be. So instead of it being relying on me creating my own character and my own pathway to victory, I have followed what FromSoft has done. And if they make more games like this, I'm wholeheartedly into it because I, I really, really enjoyed how this game played out. All right, getting on to the last few. So another one, this is the last one we're going to talk about my buddy David. So a game that I put in more time than any other game in the world is World of Warcraft, specifically World of Warcraft Vanilla Classic. And this was another one that he told me to play. And I just, it looked like a game where you were standing still most of the time. And I just, I, I don't know what, I was a little intrigued by it, but it was, again, didn't want to do it because he was telling me, and also you paying $15 a month, what was the point? But when I found out that there was PvP, and this was a time when I was heavily competitive in first person shooters and things of that nature. So the idea of like, wow, I can go into a PVP captured a flag arena, but instead of just doing headshots and grenades, I can have magic spells or a guy who drops a trap or a dude who charges with a giant sword or a guy who can heal. Like it just, the, the possibilities were endless and they sounded so cool. And so when I found out about Arathi Basin and Warsong Gulch in college from my buddy CK, that's what finally convinced me to jump in, and the rest is history. I mean, this is one of my favorite games of all time, for better or worse. I luckily have resisted Hardcore Classic. If they end up doing Classic Plus, they probably will drag me back in, much to my own detriment, and hopefully I don't disappear from the channel for another seven months like I did in 2019. But I mean, I don't have to say, I mean, WoW is great. It's it's so fun. It, there's so much you can do in it. It's it, The thing that's the best about the original WoW 2 is that a lot of people say how the end game is super easy. The PvP is super easy. The, pr the thing is, is that the game itself is hard to play as you have to dedicate the time. You have to meet the people. You have to make the right connections. So if you can get 40 people together or if you can get a team together and gel with them, then the rest of it should be easy. But it's doing that outside of the game stuff that's hard that makes it uh, an experience i wasn't able to get in any other game or still to this day all right so here's one that i was dead wrong on but i was dead wrong on the other side now i don't remember reading much about it i'm not sure why i picked it up it's also just oh it's an n64 game so you gotta know that i made a mistake and that is war gods I'm not a fighting game fan i don't know why i picked this up i already had mortal kombat trilogy at this time I didn't pick up Killer Instinct Gold, but I picked up Stupid War Gods. I, maybe because I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a fan of mythologies. I love Greek mythology and Roman mythology, Norse mythology, Egyptian mythology. So maybe I thought, oh, I could play as Anubis or I could play as... I don't even know. But they don't even really have anything like that. It's, just, it's such a terrible game. I... I can't say more bad things about this. This was literally one of the worst purchases I ever made. I remember buying it and just thinking immediately, well, you win some, you lose some. Guess let's go back and play something else. I probably I probably played this for a weekend and then put it down after paying $60 for it brand new and I want to say 97 maybe? 97 or so? Yeah, terrible game. Uh, it's just, it's not a very... It's a 3D fighting game, so akin to Mortal Kombat 4, but it's just the, it's sluggish. The characters just the the move sets are awful. The game is awful. It looks bad. It's just it's bad. So there's one that I was wrong about because it was so bad. I just wanted to throw that in there. All right, and then the last two we have. So this was one that I was wrong about more because I wanted to will it to be bad, not because it actually was bad. And I don't even remember hearing about the lead up to it because it was for a system called the Xbox that everyone assumed was going to be dead in the water. 3DO died, Jaguar died, uh, the CDI died, the Turbo Graphics no one even knew was dead, but it had been dead for a decade. Dreamcast died. Nope. Somehow, Microsoft, with all its money, managed to live, and that was with a little game called Halo. So when I was playing GoldenEye and trying to have all my friends play GoldenEye, everyone was talking about this new game named Halo, and I just didn't see it. I thought it was bad. I assumed it was bad without ever playing it. Didn't play the campaign. Didn't want it. Didn't like it. Not GoldenEye. You guys are wrong. Sorry. Subject's closed. We're not talking about it. And I was wrong. Halo's a fun game. Halo's a very fun game. 
I still like Goldeneye more, but there's a reason why Halo is still going to this day, and Bungie is still going to this day, and they made a very, very good game, a very good competitive multiplayer, and when Halo 2 came out, I did come around. Because of the sword! The sword got me. Once you had that ability for one-hit kills, like I enjoyed in Goldeneye with License to Kill mode, alright. I, and that's what I'm talking about. When you find something that's a hook for you in a game, it's amazing how it takes it 2 to a 10. Uh, it's just, you gotta look for that stuff. Once you find it, glom onto it and they'll make you really appreciate something. Especially if you're not really feeling it at first. Because then I started liking the shotgun. I like the sniper rifle. But really, it was finding that one, that pathway into the gateway into the game. And then the last one. This one really, still to this day, shocks me because it is my third favorite game of all time. Even above World of Warcraft. And that is XCOM Enemy Unknown. So it was so funny. I saw, I had Game Informer back in the, t in the day. I was doing a show in 2013, a touring musical uh, called Miss Nelson is Missing. And the director was a gamer and he knew I was a gamer. And so he asked me maybe about two months after that Game Informer came out that, that was about XCOM. He asked me, hey, are you interested in, in XCOM? And I'm like, no, I'm over first-person shooters. I'm not really into that. And he kind of looked at me like, what are you talking about? It's, a, it's, a, it's like a turn-based tactical game, like the originals. I'm like, excuse me? Yeah. I didn't even read the articles. I didn't even look at it. I just looked at the screenshots, and I think I saw people pointing guns from an angle and assumed, oh, it's a third-person shooter or something of that nature. Lo and behold, I then went back when I got home and read the article and saw what I had been missing. And then I looked up videos of it and saw, oh my God, this looks incredible. And luckily by that point, the game was coming out and I want to say the next two or three weeks or a month or so, like it was coming up soon after that. And I was so damn hyped for it. I couldn't believe it. I was so shocked that I had missed out on this game. I couldn't believe it. Or maybe it was out. I, I can't remember exactly. Maybe it was out and I just didn't have the money for it. <laughs> but I wanted it so bad. And when I finally got it, I took it over to my older brother's house. And we started a uh, campaign on his Xbox. And we just got immersed in how cool it was. Naming our characters. We named it after ourselves. This is where that uh, that famous Obama story I told you about came from. When it, with his... Uh, his, his going through and destroying all the different crystallids before he got turned into a zombie and then we had to take him out. It was just an incredible game. Loved it so much. I then eventually took it back home, played it on my Xbox, got to the end, and just played through it over. Like, this is a game I could play through endlessly. I like it more than XCOM 2. I think it's a better game than XCOM 2. And I've never played the DLC version of this. I have played War of the Chosen for 2, which is good, though at some points, I think the, the vanilla, vanilla experience for both is better. But a phenomenal game. Um, that's why I love Mario Rabbit's Kingdom Battles, because it essentially is a stripped-down version of this with, instead of having 80%, 90%, 60% shots, that you didn't miss, you have a 50% shot or a 100% shot or a miss. So it, it makes it a lot more user friendly. But a phenomenal game. If you haven't checked out XCOM Enemy Unknown, highly recommend it. Uh, especially if you like turn based um, frustration, like I do. And there you go. There are games that I was dead wrong on, that I misjudged, that I was an idiot. But luckily, I redeemed myself, except for War Gods. And really enjoyed. So let me know about some games if you guys have ever picked up or played or saw that were coming out that you just thought were going to be bad. Just didn't look right. Maybe you tried one time or tried a demo and it was awful. Only to find out the game was phenomenal and you loved it. Because uh, when I first thought of this topic, I didn't think I'd have that many examples. But yeah, quite a few did come up. So yes, that's what you get for this week, guys. As a reminder, I do have a Patreon. I have a Into the AM t-shirt link in the bottom if you want to save on that. Supports the channel. Release a video every Tuesday. And thank you guys so much for all the growth. I can't believe by this time next week we could be at 1800. And then let's see. Like I said, we, we, we kind of slowed down a little bit, but uh, we, we can still get to 2000 by the end of the year. If not, this year has already far surpassed my wildest dreams. So thank you all. Thank you all once again. All right. It's been so nice getting a hold of you. Take care.